Welcome and thank you for stopping by Sheila's Audiobooks and I am Sheila. This recording is coming from South Texas. All stories on this recording are in the public domain for United States copyright law. This story is about Vantina Headline Board of Elector, handsome, wealthy and with a sort of Peter Pan outlook on life. Olga Lee ambitious to succeed as an artist and after several months of discouraging results, she accepted a position as housemaid in a rich middle-class family in the suburbs. After some trouble she is turned outdoors, frozen and half-starved. James Cooper Vantine's driver a little selfish and ungrateful and trying to find some hope in his confused world. And sometimes people will do the craziest things for the people they care about. Canary that sang bass. Vantine, rolling luxuriously along the road in his big limousine, saw the figure of a girl leaning forlornly against a telegraph pole. It was bitter cold and snowing by fits and starts, and under the mauve light from the electric arc, her face looked like death. Vantine spoke to his chauffeur sharply. Jeems, said he, that Eliza on the ice we just passed. Don't you think it would be the humane thing to go back and investigate? She might be somebody's mother, you know. Without replying, the chauffeur turned around and drove back to the bleak, windswept corner. Don't tell me it's all a movie and the camera's hidden in the bushes across the way, Vantine cried, opening the car door. If you're one of the orphans of the storm, where is your sister? My God, James, she's fainted. James, without comment, picked the girl up bodily and deposited her in the warm, comfortable automobile. Vantine regarded him with a pained expression. You might have consulted me first, he muttered. Why, I may be compromised for life. As the car started off again, Vantine leaned forward and studied the girl closely. Undernourished she was, yet in spite of this there were traces of beauty, even of refinement, and she was young. But her clothes were an abomination, either hopelessly out of date or the last word in provincial style, and they had been brushed threadbare and pressed shiny, and besides were certainly too thin for a New York winter. What would you advise? Vantine asked his chauffeur, after a silence. Try a little brandy, suggested James, without turning around. Thank you, I will. I meant for our heroine. Give her a stiff drink and hold the smelling salts to her nose. It's either cold or hunger she's fainted. God bless me, James, I didn't know there were any fainting girls left in New York. The limousine was as large as a pullman and Vantine who was used to making quick changes in stuffy dressing rooms, worked as easily and as quickly as a magician in a straight jacket. Holding a crystal vial under her nostrils, he saw her eyelids flutter and a sort of shudder pass over her. Then he reached for his silver flask and forced a little brandy between her bloodless lips. It's all right, dearie, hasn't scratched yet, he told the feebly protesting girl. Good for what ails you. There's many a dame that would give her gold tooth for a swig of this. Where am I? She asked, struggling to an upright position, her eyes tragic with despair. Oh, Jeems, she's said it, she's said it, just like they do in stories. Cried Vantine enthusiastically. I felt you wouldn't disappoint me, dearie, he beamed in the girl's face. You're among friends. When I first got a glimpse of you, you were doing a Lost in Siberia sequence, but it's all Jake now. Where shall my mechanician take you? Is it the Ritz? My God, she's fainted again. Do you think it's catching? Home, Jeems home. Arriving at the actor's home, a handsome apartment in the East Fifties, just off Fifth Avenue, James opened the car door to find Vantine sitting with the unknown girl's head on his shoulder. And what was more, he had discarded his fur-lined topcoat and wrapped it around her slender figure. His eyes were shining with mischief like a schoolboy's when he met the chauffeur's disapproving gaze. It's all right, Jeems he insisted, all in the interests of my art. You'll have laryngitis next and won't be able to sing a note, muttered James. What do you propose to do with her? Well, James, we can't put her under a neighbor's cabbage and say the stork left her grinned Vantine. Brody took a chance and who am I to dodge the issue? Let's get her into the house and see if it's bad booze or good morals. You know, James, there are still ladies who die for their convictions, in spite of the comic strips. 
she might have been walking home when we found her. Pick up the marbles, you win, groaned James, and led the way into the apartment. Half an hour later the doctor stated it was a clear case of malnutrition, which prompted Van Tyne to observe that it sounded as complicated as smallpox. But he was tireless in his efforts to help, giving freely of time and money, hovering around the sick couch like an anxious mother hen. James had retired with the car, but a grim-visaged housekeeper surveyed the scene with silent disapproval, helping only when she was requested to buy Van Tyne himself. God knows who she is, muttered old Henrietta sternly. Bellevue is the place further likes, of her. I never thought I'd live to see you bringing promiscuous females home with you, sir. Oh, is she promiscuous, Etta demanded Van Tyne. I thought the doctor said she was sore of anemic. Well, if you won't have her in your room, I'll have to let her stay in mine. Wait, wait, good creature. I mean that I'll go elsewhere of course. Oh, yes, indeed, I'll go elsewhere. But she can't be moved for a day or two, you know. If she developed pneumonia and died her death would be on our heads or on your head, for I'm willing to let her stay. Now, make up your mind quickly, my friend do I move to the Ritz or does she share your room? At a gal, at a. It was late the next afternoon before the girl gave a clear account of herself to Ventine. When he was ready to depart for the matinee, he said to his housekeeper, Don't badger her, Henrietta. And while he was smiling, as usual, she never dreamed of disobeying him. Though she would have denied it, as heresy, Vantine was the old creature's god. Nor had James forgotten her. How's the little stranger? He asked, as Vantine stepped into the car. My god, James, if the neighbors hear you. They'll think I've got a maternity ward in there, gasped the actor. And, hands off, or I'll tell your wife on you. That's the way with you big, handsome shakes, never satisfied unless you've got the entree to a harem. Not I, said the chauffeur I was thinking of you. Better have Henrietta nail down the furniture. What has the girl to say for herself? I have refrained from questioning her until she becomes acclimated, answered Van Tyne grinning. Oh. Booked for an indefinite engagement, eh? Van Tyne was headlining at a vaudeville house in Yonkers and it was six o'clock when he returned to his apartment for dinner. Dressed in one of Henrietta's gowns which was much too large for her in every way, the girl, obviously, was waiting for her host in anything but a tranquil frame of mind. If he had known it, this was because the housekeeper had refused to listen to her explanations without Van Tyne's being present. Frightened, friendless, with an unpleasant experience behind her, this had awakened her suspicions and she would have run away if the actor himself hadn't walked in at that moment. Van Tyne stopped, bowed, and observed with a smile, Well, I'm glad to see you without a mortuary slab, but if we're going to celebrate with a masquerade, give me time to dress for it, too. Etta. Are you trying to make this poor child resemble you? She looks like Mrs. Noah, as if she came out of the ark in that costume. For shame. Henrietta Wickham. The old dame's face turned red in spots. It was the best I could do, sir, she muttered. You said to burn her own things. Telephone to Jenny, to Larry Collins, to any one of the dozen ateliers. Van Tyne began, when the girl interrupted to say quietly, Indeed, this is very comfortable and warm and I am very much obliged to Mrs. Wickham. I am sorry that you had to burn my things, because they were my best. Nonsense, my child cried the actor. If we didn't do away with old clothes, how do you expect the dressmakers would get rid of their new ones? She's really pretty, you know, Henrietta I wonder if you mind telling me your name my dear? Mine's Ventine. I am Olga Lee, explained the girl, with a slight blush rising to her cheeks. You have been most kind, Mr. Ventine. At this, both the actor and his housekeeper made a little clucking noise with their tongues against the roof of the mouth, and Olga stopped short startled. But after Van Tyne and Henrietta had exchanged glances, he nodded to the girl, encouragingly. It kind of took my breath for a moment, that's all, he said. No one ever calls me Mr. Van Tyne. You see. You wouldn't say Mr. God, would you? demanded Henrietta, up in arms. At dinner Olga told the story of her experiences since coming to New York in quest of a career. No, she wasn't stage struck. She was ambitious to succeed as an artist, which Van Tyne explained to Henrietta was a hundred times worse. For pretty girls often have a stage career, while pretty artists seldom get anywhere on their looks alone. 
After several months of discouraging results, down to her last dime, Olga had accepted a position as housemaid in a rich middle-class family in the suburbs there a rather usual occurrence had happened and when she had resisted the advances of the young cub who was the son and heir, he had gone to his mother, denouncing Olga, with the result that the girl was turned outdoors, then and there. All this Olga Lee told in a simple, straightforward way without heroics, so that even Henrietta became indignant and threatened vengeance on the family in the suburbs. And this good opinion was strengthened when Olga added that she supposed art was not for her, and that she had decided to pocket her pride and return to her hometown. She had been a school teacher. Precious little romance had entered her life, but she had some good friends there. Quietly she announced her intention of telegraphing for her fair home her brother who wouldn't advance her money to remain in New York, would send her that. Of course that's the sensible thing to do, nodded Van Tyne gravely, when she had finished her story, but whoever did the sensible thing when he or she was twenty? Etta, you know the child ought to have her chance. What a lovely climax if our little friend here painted the prize picture of the season and then ritzed suburbia when it came to pay homage. If you mean that woman and her son Miss Olga ought to turn them out of doors, the same as they did her, Henrietta snorted. If I know relatives, there's not going to be any fatted calf killed when you go home, dearie. No, said Olga sighing, but it will all be secure and safe. After the last few months I feel that I desire peace and security even more than romance or a career. After dispatching the telegram, Van Tyne set to work to make Olga as comfortable as possible, while awaiting her brother's reply. He saw no reason why she couldn't remain in the apartment, under the capable wing of Henrietta Wickham, and he gave instructions, while he was at work, to use the motor car to woo the roses back into the child's cheeks. So, after taking Van Tyne to the matinee, James came back and picked up Olga and old Henrietta, riding them around until it was time to call for the actor and go home for supper. It was a not unpleasant routine and when her brother didn't reply to her wire the next day, Olga wasn't exactly plunged into deepest despair. He would send the money, and in the meanwhile Henrietta was most kind. Henrietta's kindness, besides bed and board included an extensive and stunning wardrobe, more beautiful than anything Olga had ever dreamed of, even as a successful artist. It was more than her feminine heart could do to withstand the clothes. Though how I am ever going to pay for them repay you she murmured looking at Van Tyne with mild reproach. He laughed loudly, in excellent spirits after you've captured the rich man's son in your hometown, send a check to the fund for fangless serpents and we'll call it square, he said you know. Etta, she does look charming. The child does us proud. We'll have to celebrate tonight, I'll take you all to Tex Guinan's new place. How's that? That night Olga made a half-hearted inquiry regarding her benefactor. She knew he was an actor headlining in vaudeville, but the name Van Tyne meant nothing to her, much to Mrs. Wickham's displeasure. Henrietta thought Van Tyne was just about the finest artist in the business and she said so in a voice which made Olga feel suddenly very small and ashamed. She apologized and changed the subject, wondering out loud why her brother didn't answer her appeal for help. That afternoon, however, when they called for Van Tyne in Brooklyn, where he was headlining that week, James came back to the car to explain that the actor was still on the stage, the star having been placed to close the bill. I'll just go in and hurry things along, Henrietta muttered, climbing out of the machine. His dresser is about as useful as a fifth wheel to a wagon and it's quite a step to New York and back between shows. As she got out, Olga made a move as it to follow her and then drew back, waiting for the old woman to invite her into the theater, which Henrietta did all kindness again and the two disappeared through the stage door. Van Tyne was on the stage, responding to what proved to be the fifth or sixth encore that afternoon. They love him. The audiences everywhere just love him. Old Etta whispered, with pride in her voice. On tiptoe Olga followed her to the first entrance, but before that she could hear a man singing. While the foots half blinded her, she could still make out the figure of Van Tyne facing that black, yawning space which was massed with people. Her first thought was that Van Tyne seemed taller and huskier than she imagined him to be. He was dressed in overalls, open at the neck and with sleeves rolled up and he carried a battered straw hat in his hand boyish, good-looking, his fine baritone carried the rather cheap words and sticky melody with a swing that brought the house to its feet. Van Tyne held the audience in his hand, and left it begging for more. Back he came again and again, bowing, but shaking his head. 
He won't sing any more Henrietta whispered to Olga go back and wait in the car, I'll see if I can hurry things up and we'll be with you in a jiffy. The last she saw of Van Tyne he was bowing himself off the stage into the opposite entrance, but as she fumbled with the heavy stage door Olga heard the orchestra begin another tune, and then a high soprano voice but one of the stage hands was holding the door open for her and she passed out without stopping to listen. At the end of the alley, James was smoking a cigarette which he didn't throw away when he saw her coming. That was a peculiarity of Van Tyne's help they were his friends. The chauffeur leaned familiarly against the car door, willing to talk. What did you think of the canary? He demanded, eyeing Olga over his cigarette. She drew herself up a little stiffly, not resenting his manner but his words. Meaning Miss Meaning Van Tyne? She countered, coolly. James laughed. Think he's wonderful, like the rest of them, don't you? I know he's been most wonderful to me, Olga replied, flushing. It is only when I think of others, that I realize how wonderful Van Tyne has been. After looking at her long and thoughtfully, James shook his head. Poor kid, I believe you did get a raw deal, he observed. And Van Tyne's all right, I guess I'm just small and mean enough to be jealous, that's all. I suppose old Henrietta's told you what he's done for me. No, she hasn't, Olga answered, thinking that he'd be quite handsome but for the bitter mouth and cynical eyes. At that moment Van Tyne came running out of the stage entrance with the housekeeper in tow and they piled into the car and hurried home to the apartment in the fifties. And after the night show the four of them repaired to a supper club, Henrietta looking very much the grand dame in black velvet and James wearing a tuxedo under his liveried greatcoat. James's other name is Cooper, explained the old creature, watching Olga closely. Evidently the name meant nothing to the girl and so she continued, his father is Jay. Sterling Cooper worth a couple of million or more, and obviously not on very good terms with his son. Really, you can't blame the parent for once. While at college James got himself married to a first-class little gold digger and Cooper kicked him out. There's where Van Tyne comes in. He gave James a job when all the father's friends were afraid to help the son. Why shouldn't he come with us tonight? Let me tell you, child, Van Tyne wouldn't hi-hat a skunk. They recognized Van Tyne at the nightclub and the orchestra played over a number of his songs, while the energetic hostess tried to coax him into singing, but he murmured something about his contract and performing in public, and after that they let him alone. He was immaculately groomed, with a clean, rosy, blonde appearance. Also he danced well, as Olga discovered when she danced with him. Enjoying yourself? He wanted to know, with his habitual good-natured smile. You'll dance with James, won't you? When he discards his scenery, he's just a regular guy, like me. Never judge a person by his scenery, Ollie. Cooper won't always be a chauffeur, but Hetta told you, she says. So the next time the music started Olga danced with James. As a matter of fact, he didn't dance as well as Van Tyne, yet there was a difference. Taller, broader, he hadn't the air, the finisher the professional that was it, she decided. She danced a second time and then Van Tyne cut in. Look here, I asked you to dance with him, not spend the evening, he avowed. If he needs exercise, let him drag Henrietta around the room. Or, I believe she is flirting with the distinguished looking butter and egg man in the corner. We're never too old to yawn, Ollie. It's a great life if we don't waken. It was dawn when they arrived home, tired but happy, and Olga found her telegram. Your brother sick with measles. Do not care to worry him with your real start adventures at present. Ada. Ada was her sister-in-law. White and crushed, Olga handed Van Tyne the message without comment. Oh, sweet, sweet. Murmured the actor, passing the telegram to old Henrietta and James. I suppose if the lady herself opened her heart, a moth would fly out. You should worry, child. Think no more about it and stay right here until your brother comes out of the ether what? Deary. No man related to you ever married a woman like Ada while he was in his right mind. He'll come too. Olga looked as if she was going to cry. I, I oughtn't to remain here, she said, looking at Henrietta Wickham. If Ada ever found out I'd been here with you this long you don't know what a small town is, Van Tyne. Thank you, but I'll have to look around for something to do. Van Tyne ridiculed the idea but for once James and Henrietta were against him and in the end Olga went to live in a moderate-rate hotel on the other side of Fifth Avenue, while waiting for something to turn up. It turned up, promptly and forcibly, in Van Tyne's declaration of love. 
At first Ollie didn't know what to say to him. In spite of his many kindnesses, his daily visits, the car always at her service and everything, she didn't dream he cared for her well, in that way, until he said so. Now, he wanted her to marry him at once and thumb her nose at Ada and her hometown. There was never a callow youth so impetuous, so ardent and yet so tender. She looked at this man, this man, who in spite of his unlined face and supple body, was no longer a boy, and felt a little sorry for him without knowing exactly why. She liked him well enough. His thoughtfulness, his generosity won her admiration and made her very gentle with him. That was it she couldn't bear to hurt Ventine. He was such a dear, a darling old dear, who deserved the best in life. And so Ollie said yes and almost immediately regretted it. For when his household heard the news, Henrietta and James acted for all the world as if she had robbed an infant of its candy. They don't like me, Olga whispered to her fiancé. Either that or they don't trust me. I wonder. I wonder if they believe what I've said is true. So help me, heaven. It's all right, sweetheart, I believe you, Vantine interposed, drawing her into his arms. And Detta believes you too, of course. It's only that I've been an old stick in the mud so long. They think I'll interfere with your career? Good lord, no. Don't pay any attention to them either of them. It's none of Cooper's business. It's none of Etta's, either, as far as that goes, but she's been with me so long worked so faithfully I guess she thinks I'm still a kid. I'm not. Sometimes I get to wondering if I'm not too old, sweetheart. You old? She mocked. Well, I'm older than you, Ollie, he smiled. The trouble is Henrietta regards me as a sort of Peter Pan, when as a matter of fact I'm just like other men. Just. Exactly. And we're going to live and love and grow old and die just like thousands of other couples, honey. Like regular folks that's what I want. You know, my real name is Robinson Frank Robinson. Well, I'd like you and me to be Mr. and Mrs. Frank Robinson, in our own home, away, far away from the theater and Broadway and the nightclubs. Through the old, gay smile Olga glimpsed the seriousness that was in his heart, divined the eager, pathetic longing for sympathy and understanding that pleaded for recognition. You are Peter Pan, she said suddenly, and leaning forward, kissed him. His happiness shone from his eyes, was reflected in everything he did. It was impossible to remain displeased with him, or to shun Olga because he loved her, and presently old Etta capitulated. Only, be good to my boy, she said, taking Ollie by the shoulders and gazing into her eyes. I used to think he was happy before you came, without a care in the world, but he wasn't then like he is now. He seems to worship you. I'm sure your life will be a bed of roses if you're only good to him. James still remained a bit skeptical when he called with the car to take Olga anywhere. Of course his salary is 2,000 a week net and he can work 50 weeks a year if he chooses. When it comes to buying a country home, you can live in Newport if you like. Vantine saved a lot, too. She looked at him long and steadily. I'm sorry you formed that opinion of me, she said at last. I hadn't an idea what Frank's salary is, and nobody ever told me he had saved a penny. It isn't money. He has been so kind to me. Then it's gratitude, not love? James Cooper interrupted quickly. Olga flushed and glanced away. I think you should be the last man in the world to try to show Vantine the floor in the sapphire, she murmured. James shook his head. I'm not made of the stuff of heroes, he pointed out. I'm selfish, ungrateful, a damn rotter if you like, but that's me. I can't stand aside for another man, even a man who has been my benefactor. You see, I happen to love you myself, Olga. I love you, do you hear that? And when he touches you I want to punch his head and when he kisses you I'd like to kill him. Now go and tell him so. Maybe he'll give me my chance to beat him up. The girl lifted her head and drew a deep breath and he saw that her eyes were shining like stars. All this while I've tortured myself that you didn't think I was good enough for him, she said simply. Good enough? You not good enough for him? Yes. Perhaps I'm not, James. Say Jim, he pleaded. Olga nodded. Yes, I like that Jim, she pronounced. Well she breathed hard and seemed to wait. Then he took her in his arms and began to rain kisses on her upturned face, on her shy, young eyes, her cool brow, her flushed cheeks and her dewy lips. Kisses came short, sharp hot. It was almost as if they left a scar. Olga, after a moment, fought herself free, resentful, 
frightened, hungry for more at one and the same time. You mustn't. She gasped. Jim Cooper smiled, you can't marry Vantine now, he said. But. You can't, he reiterated. That was all. It was true enough, but what could she do about it? Vantine was going ahead with plans for their wedding and at his urging Ollie had written home, telling the parsimonious Ada that she was engaged to a man whose income exceeded the president's. Incidentally, this letter brought about the immediate recovery of the brother and an invitation from Ada to spend their honeymoon with them. Vantine said he knew he was going to enjoy his sister-in-law, but he said it without rancor. Always generous, thoughtful of others, smiling. And Olga couldn't marry him she couldn't, now. Ollie didn't see much of her fiancé these days. He was rehearsing a new act, Henrietta said. And Ollie did see too much of Jim Cooper too much for her own peace of mind. One afternoon he brought the car for her and around five o'clock, following some shopping, set her down at the stage entrance to a vaudeville house uptown. Olga went in to look for Vantine. Usually she waited in the car, but since she knew it would mean a long, dangerous conversation alone with Cooper, she decided to go into the theater. Music, lights, silent, creeping figures. Someone was singing, a soprano which was affected and irritating. It rubbed Olga Lee the wrong way. It jarred upon her nerves. She disliked the voice before she saw the singer. Strolling to the first entrance, she saw a simpering blonde, half-nude in clothes that were supposed to be daring, with too much chest and back and bare legs. But the house roared its delight at the conclusion of the song, and the singer returned again and again. Olga watched the scene listlessly, wondering what manner of artiste was this to work an audience into such a frenzy of enthusiasm. And then, while she looked, the singer's jeweled hand went up and the golden wig came off revealing the close-cropped head of a man. Of Vantine, of course. Before she had fully recovered from the shock, the impersonator was off to change to his farmer's boy overalls, when he would sing an encore in his natural voice baritone. Somehow Ollie made her way out of the theater, found the automobile and got in. Since her agitation was apparent, James threw away his cigarette and came to question her. Why didn't you tell me? She asked him reproachfully. Tell you what? Demanded Cooper. Good lord, Ollie, you look as if you had seen a ghost. She shook her head. I have just seen Vantine for the first time, she said. Funny I never gave it a thought. And I suppose you thought I knew all about his his line. It was terrible. Jim frowned. He's rehearsing a new act now perhaps he suspected you wouldn't care for the, the, wig. I loathe it. I loathe him. Any man who would do such a thing. Jim Cooper reached for a cigarette. Oh, there are worse, he ventured begrudgingly. As a matter of fact, he added slowly, as if the words were wrung from him against his will, Van's a regular. After all, what does it matter whether you don't skirts and sing soprano or jump into boots and follow a plow? You wouldn't do it, Olga flashed. Me? Well, I, I couldn't. Too big, too hefty. It wouldn't be an impersonation, it would be a burlesque. Vantine's framing a new act, I believe, with all straight stuff no skirts, you understand. A little shudder ran through her. It makes no difference. I can never forget what I've seen this afternoon. Vantine saw the change which had come over her for love had sharpened his wits, and Ollie wasn't a good actress. For that matter, it seemed to the girl the kindest thing she could do, to let him know once and for all that she couldn't marry him. Every time she saw him he had some new and wonderful scheme to unfold, gifts to offer. It wasn't fair to let him go on this way, hoping, giving, while in her heart she knew his dreams could never come true and so Olga told him. It was all a mistake. She didn't love him. They could never be more than friends to each other. At first Vantine couldn't believe it. Then, when Ollie drew away from him and presented her cheek when he tried to kiss her, he seemed to realize the full significance of her words and he collapsed, like a doomed man in sight of the gallows. He dropped to his knees, he clung to her hands, her dress, weeping and pleading. He'd rather a hundred times die than lose her, he couldn't give her up. Olga suddenly found herself hating his tears. They weren't just manly. They seemed to go with the golden wig and the décolleté gown and all at once she grew a little cold, hard, indifferent. You should have told me, she said, with sullen eyes. Told you what, sweetheart? That you are well, what you are. This afternoon I saw your act for the first time, and I, I loathed it. I've always felt that a man was a sort of superior being. 
It was a privilege to be born a man. I've just got to look up to a man, my man anyway and then today, you, blonde curls and short skirts and a falsetto voice I'm sorry, I can't help it. I hated you for being that, Vantine. Then, said he emphatically, I too never be that again, dearest. That's easy, that's simple, Ollie as a matter of fact, I've been rehearsing a new act for some time the booking office likes the impersonation, but yes, I had decided to get away from it even before you expressed your views on the subject. Fortunately I'm blessed with a good natural baritone. She couldn't let him go on like this, hope and plan again, when she knew the futility of it all in her heart. It's no use, Vantine. What? For goddess sake, Olga. It's no use. Oh, I know I'm the most ungrateful wretch in the world. After all you've done your sweetness and kindness to me. That's out. He interposed. No matter what I've done for you, you've done more for me Ollie. I don't believe I understand, she faltered. Ollie, you've waked me up, Vantine said then pleading with bloodshot eyes. Before you came into my life there was something something lacking. Maybe I was the Peter Pan that Henrietta tried to keep me. I wasn't a man, I only played at living as a child plays with his toy soldiers. And then you came and everything changed overnight almost. I loved you from the first, Ollie. I didn't know it because I had never been in love before but I loved you. And I was no longer a child. I became a man through loving you. Now that you've done this thing, awakened me, you can't you can't, leave me flat, dearest. You can't run away and expect me to go back to my toy soldiers. I'll promise anything in the world Olga. I'll never appear on the stage again, if you say so. I've money, plenty of money. We'll go to Europe sweetheart. Only for God's sake don't leave me. Neither man nor child. You can't, you daren't, Ollie. She tried to spare him, tried to lie, but the truth was Olga knew if he kissed her ever again, with her heart full of another man, she would want to do him physical injury. Vantine, she said, with cruel kindness, there is somebody else. Looking back, I think I've loved him from the very first, just as you say you loved me so perhaps you'll understand. It's Jim Cooper. His surprise was genuine. James? Don't call him that. Olga stormed if you knew how that silly affected talk sounded. I beg your pardon, Vantine said, with dignity. Of course I shan't do it again if you dislike it so much. But of course you're not in earnest either about caring for him. With all my heart and soul I care, Vantine. He's a married man. He doesn't live with his wife. They haven't lived together for more than a year. After Jim's father turned him out, and cut off his allowance, this, this girl left him. It was only Jim's prospects she cared for, you see. When he had no money why? Oh I don't consider her at all. Vantine looked at her strangely but you've got to consider her, Ollie. He insisted. You're not the kind of girl who can be happy without your neighbor's respect. You're a homebody his voice broke and he began to cry again, weak, silent tears that left her helpless. Well, Olga ventured, after a pause, I suppose I'll never see you again, and I suppose you'll go to your grave cursing and hating me, but... One more chance, Ollie. If you're ashamed of the skirts and wig and we go to Europe nobody will ever know. She shook her head and at last he saw that nothing he could say or do would ever change her. Where are you going? He asked, swallowing a lump in his throat. To Jim. I see. And then? We're going away together. Vantine turned the color of chalk. He oughtn't to ask it, Cooper oughtn't to ask it of you, he muttered, half to himself. That damned frail, if she had the decency of an alley cat she'd give him a divorce. But she won't, she won't of course. Old man Cooper will have to die some day and she's hanging on for that. And in the meanwhile Ollie's stealing her happiness. He was still talking, half to himself, when Olga stole noiselessly away. That night he told Henrietta that everything was off between him and Ollie Lee and the old dame scarcely knew whether to be relieved or angry. She was not unlike a mother who finds it hard to give up her boy even to the finest girl in the world but if Vantine wanted this girl he shook his head, laughed, and said he guessed he was wedded to his art. As usual, James called at the theatre the next afternoon for Vantine, and as usual, Olga was in the car, at the actor's special request. But if she had hesitated at coming along, Ollie soon realized that her fears were groundless, for Vantine seemed quite like his old self, joking, gossiping in a simpering, affected manner that made you smile even while you disapproved. 
no regret, no reproach. Everything merry until at 42nd Street the actor remembered that he had an appointment to meet a friend at the Club Blur at 5 o'clock. He asked James to wait for him and left Olga in the car. The friend he met there was a young woman who apparently couldn't speak without a sneer and whose eyes were suspicious, mocking, avaricious, at one and the same time. Handsome in a way, yet unpleasant to look at. Vantine thought of Ollie and understood Jim Cooper's infatuation. What he couldn't understand was how James had ever got himself entangled with Dot. I was just going, she told Vantine, as he hurried forward to join her at a small table in the nearly empty restaurant What's the Big? Why did you send for me to meet you here? Has James been naughty? Be your age dearie, Vantine retorted, sitting opposite to her. Don't attempt to hi-hat me, because I know you, woman. Why did I send for you? Because you are so fascinating. What'll you have to drink? And where did you get that hat, Dorothy? My God, it looks like a ravaged market cart. You should worry, she muttered sullenly you didn't bring me here to say that, Vantine. And when I want some of your brand of comedy I'll go to the show. He shrugged his shoulders and took a pocket flask from his clothes. But when Dot Cooper reached for it, Vantine drew the flask towards him and called a waiter for drinks. What's the matter, saving your special poison for your pals? The girl sneered. I suppose it's too good for me, eh? Well, remember you asked me to come here, not I you. He merely grinned. The waiter returned with their order and Dorothy raised her glass to her lips. Dot, said Vantine, watching her closely, have you ever thought about getting a divorce from Cooper? No, she answered coolly. Well, will you consider getting a divorce? For a consideration, of course. She burst out laughing. What's the matter? Do you want to marry him? She cried. The blood rushed to Vantine's cheeks and his hand closed around the pocket flask he had brought along with him. Then he called their waiter back for a second round of drinks. We'll have your little joke, won't you, Dot? He remarked, after the fellow had gone. Jim Cooper may seem like a joke to you, she countered, but he's a damn good investment for me. His old man won't live forever. And he's going to leave Jim his, never fear. And then I'll get mine, but. Yes, I'll divorce him for a million cash. A million. What are you doing, telling me your telephone number? He jeered. Why should I tell you my telephone number you poor fluff? The woman said. Look here, I don't know what your game is, but get this straight I'm watching my P's and Q's, I'll never give Cooper the pleasure of divorcing me, and I'll never divorce him until after the old man's gone to glory. Chirp your feeble little tune elsewhere, canary. I know my groceries. She pushed back her chair, ready to leave the table, when Vantine, with a smile, suddenly raised his flask. Just to show there's no hard feeling, he ventured. Dorothy Cooper hesitated, and Vantine filled her glass. Where's yours? She demanded, eyeing him suspiciously. Dearie, have a heart, I've got to sing tonight. She pushed back her glass. I guess I don't want any of your rotten brew, she laughed. There was a pause. Vantine cast a glance around the room and noticed it was almost empty. Like his life, he thought. All the light and gaiety had disappeared. A supper club is a dreary place when deserted. Dead, without the decency to bury itself. He filled his glass and raised it to his lips. Here's to love. He toasted. My God. Snickered the girl, and swallowed her liquor. Ten minutes later their waiter, returning for another possible order saw the pair of them limp in their chairs. He hurried over and said something, and though the man smiled faintly, the woman was beyond human aid. The waiter shook her, then grabbed Vantine. Friends, in car at the door he whispered, with the smile frozen on his lips. The waiter shrieked for help. One of you guys get them folks in the car at the door, he cried. Here's a bird and his skirt gone dead on our hands. Thank you for listening to today's episode I really hoped you enjoyed it. There will be more to come, please subscribe not to miss out on what is next. I will be looking forward to your return. The music is by Madfan from Pixabay. To support this and other artists go to pixabay.com. Sheila